Very often in the field, you're going to have winners and losers, and losers don't like being losers. Frank, how are you, mate? I'm good, Chris. Thanks for asking. I hope you're well also. Yes. Even when I'm not, mate, I don't complain these days. I just shut up and get on with it. <laughs> I do attempt that in all fairness. I do try. <laughs> yes. I find uh, dwelling on stuff just makes it worse, doesn't it? Yes. My wife describes me as a, as, as a bit, well, actually not a bit complex. She says very complex, which it's okay when it's positive. It's not so clever when it's negative, but uh, there you go. Mate, I think we're all a bit complex. Certainly those of us that have got stories to tell. Yeah, yeah. I say that because just trying to chat on the podcast with people, when I get pos podcasted by other people, I can't just tell a simple story because life isn't simple, is it? No, not at all. No, no. no. And youngsters today, no, no disrespect to our younger friends out there, God bless you, but you're very used to having it snappy, little sound bites, bit of energy, bit something flashy. And the, the richness of sort of storytelling and letting it unfold is gone. Yeah. Do you remember the, the two Ronnies? Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. And a little Ronnie Corbett used to tell the joke at the end of the show. Sitting in his chair, yeah. Uh, sitting in his chair and his feet didn't touch the ground because he was tiny. <laughs> and that joke, he would start and it would go on and on and on and it'd go all around the houses and then finally he'd get back to the, to the thing that he started with. And yeah, that's like my life. I think a lot of the things of the stories that, that we might tell, you've also had time to reflect on them as well. And if you've uh, if you if you've told them enough times, you can elaborate so much more because there's other things that you remember that you may not have remembered the first time you told the story. Mm. But uh, yeah, I take your point. Yeah, it's uh, funny enough in um, the friends I know in the speaking world, they they don't describe it so much as speaking now as storytelling because you are actually telling stories, unless you're giving, a, a, you know, an actual lecture, if you like. But, but yeah, very much storytelling. Yeah, I was preparing for a talk the other day with the, 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 um, the event managers. <laughs> I think I left them a bit gobsmacked. I don't think they would, <laughs> you, I don't think they're expecting <laughs> my grungy story. <laughs> um, do you think do we mellow with age or do we just change our behaviour because we know it ain't the right way um, I think I started off from a little bit of a Christian uh, background not in a heavy way you know not, not necessarily church every week but certainly from a Sunday school, if you like. Mm. So I kind of knew the difference between right and wrong. Uh, I think my mother also did her best to teach me right and wrong. A, cer a certain group of values, if you like. Um, and then I suppose, I suppose as time's gone on, you, it depends where you find yourself. And, you know, and you adapt yourself to certain scenarios. In some cases, it's peer pressure. Uh, sometimes it can be respect that's given to you, so therefore you respond to that. Um, I've recently just written an article, it's going to be part of a talk I'm going to do, called um, The Treadmill. And it, it, it very much explains that, that you, uh, once you get on that treadmill, you don't tend to look to the left or the right or behind you. You just keep going. 
of course, you don't question how you got on that treadmill. You, you, sometimes it's other people have put you on there. Um, and sometimes maybe you volunteer to put yourself on there. But once you're on there, it's, uh, it, it can be very, very difficult to, to hit the stop button. You know, and when you do, and then you look at where you've been, you, you get time to reflect. So, yeah, possibly as, you, as I've got older, it's, I think that's what's uh, writing a book. That's, that was time for reflection. Mm. Even these podcasts. Uh, if I look back to the first one I did with, with Sean, for example, I'd never done anything like that before. Um, then I did a second one with him and then another, and then earlier this year with um, James, with James English. And when are you ever afforded the opportunity to observe yourself? I mean, the police have probably done it enough over the years, but, um, but personally, unless you've been in somebody's video or been on their, you know, or on their phone, when have you ever had the opportunity to sit and uh, observe yourself or judge yourself? Um, that was certainly probably my first opportunity. And, e and even in that, say, 18 months, two year period, it's made me very, very conscious of what I say and how I say it. Uh, and who's going to pick up on that? Gosh. It's hard, isn't it? On the one hand, from the podcaster's perspective, I just want to say whatever the frick I want when I want to say it. I've got a stupid sense of humour because I'm ex-military. Right? Even, even I've realised now, even the Marines don't, don't get all my jokes. <laughs> so I think things have cha changed a bit, right? And... Um, and it's funny, you look at people like Joe Rogan, who's on his show smoking weed and talking about, well, he's only, he only does like, um, uh, what's the word? Hallucinogenic type of drugs. So he's not into like the street drugs, you know, coke and speed and all that sort of stuff. But even so, you know, he gets away with talking about quite, a lot, right? But he used to talk about it even deeper, and it's why a lot of us love that show, right? Yeah. He used to talk about the moon landing hoax and 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 yeah. and thing, things like the events in New York and this sort of stuff, and all the kind of nitty gritty that young people that want to know what's going on in life really appreciate, you know. And then yeah. one day. One day, when suddenly he found himself with millions of subscribers, all that stopped. You know, mm. might have just been a, a, a chat he had with his missus and said, "Look, I've yeah. got the best show in the world. If I keep on like that, I ain't gonna have it very long, am I, love?" And she probably would have gone, "No, Joe, you won't." So, cut out the conspiracy stuff and, you know, talk talk about it. <laughs> I was going to say talk about shit, but it's, it, 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 does, it does make you wonder. You're right. You're well, right. I'm conscious. I made a comment in, um, I think it was, I think it was during a podcast with James English. And I started to get a bit carried away. I started to kind of resort back to the old me, not, not the current me. So I found myself speaking like I would have done 15, 20 years ago, maybe. Mm. And I made a comment and I didn't explain it very well. And it must have come across as really cold and really hard. And it's not what I meant. It, it actually was trying to explain, don't go down that same path because this is what you could possibly do. Mm. Um, and I didn't explain the whole circumstances. Damage would have been done to a building, not to human beings. Yeah, that I got you. Across. And consequently, what happened, someone who'd seen James's podcast, it formed a Sunday paper um, in Belfast. So all of us, I'm not sure it was a headline, but it was certainly in, in a Sunday paper. Um, you know, basically saying that I was prepared to throw a hand grenade into, uh, into certain buildings. So the next podcast I did, I had to make that perfectly clear. 
<laughs> that there wouldn't have actually been any human beings damaged, if you like, you know? Yeah. And that's why I say you've got to be so conscious of what you say. Yeah, the good thing about podcasting, though, especially with someone like James Eel Shaw, is if you did make a boo-boo, and I just mean, you know, you're chatting. That's what you're doing. You're, you're, yeah. you're chatting like you would to a mate in a pub. Yeah. But, but with a podcast, at least you can say to the podcast, look, can you just take that bit out? It's going to cause me aggro. And, and well, I'll I didn't even realise. That's, that's, that's half the problem, you see, because I've, I've taken on this different persona. I've, I've gone back to something I'm now not. So it was almost like dramatic effect. So I can imagine from short, um, James's point of view, that must have been good drama for him. Mm. He certainly wasn't defending my actions. Uh, or what I'd said. So I thought, well, once I'd said it, I'd said it. That's it. Um, but I've made sure every opportunity I've had since is, is to make it perfectly clear that's not what I'm. It's not what I'm advocating. You know. Yeah. I've, it, for, for our friends at home, listen. The beauty of podcasting is that it's pretty much unedited. It's you know we're not the BBC, right? We're not. <laughs> I, I used to do or I've done two and a half hour interviews with a BBC. When it's come out on the radio, it's 25 seconds. Yeah. That um, is what some, someone has sat on the phone with me for two and a half hours with their dictaphone on record. And rather than go, Chris, we're only gonna, we only need 20. You know, they, they make out that it's like they want to interview you and da 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 da. And of course you give them your story. and. No, they just want some soundbite that they can twist into not a lie because you're not lying, but that but they will put it in a different wrapper to make what you said something completely, you know, that's that's um that's why podcasting is so much better than mainstream. Media. I think they're not alone in that because I also had an experience once with the uh, with the police and um when I was actually you know arrested and charged, etc. And I was asked, um, and I assume the tape was off. I just assume this was a, an off-the-cuff comment, you know, remark. And um, it, what the comment was, oh, well, Frank, you know what guns are for, don't you? And I said, yeah, they're for shooting people. Now, he could have said to me, you know what a cigarette lighter is for? And I was just lighting a fag. So I was responding to what I thought was an innocent question. Um, but of course, when that came up at a later stage, it was almost like me saying, I knew what the guns I had were for, were for shooting people. A completely different, completely different context. So I, would, I, would, I learned not to be so, uh, so honest, if you like, you know. I've only had to edit one bit of any, all of my hundred odd podcasts out, and it was I'm not going to say who it was, but <laughs> for obvious reasons, but it was one serviceman. And we're talking about drinking culture in the military. And he said, bloody hell, the RAF are like the worst. <laughs> in the Navy or the Marines, you, you, you drink a lot, right? It's kind of nautical culture, rum and all that, that you know, all the history and, and stuff and port. He's like, nah, the RAF. <laughs> oh. And then he... Um, Message me, said Chris, could you just take that bit out? I'm, I'm going to get myself in so, so <laughs> much trouble, so much trouble at work because he was, he was um, still in the military. So, um, yeah, funny. But uh, let's go back to the be beginning, then, Frank. What you ended up running guns in Belfast for the mm -hmm. loyalists. Yes. So I'm guessing what organisations like the UVF. Um, and such well, it was like. actually the UDA for the yeah for, for accuracy it was the UDA yeah Ulster Defence Association I, yeah, that's yeah been been a while since I was over there yeah. <laughs> but um but you came up through the football um, stands didn't didn't you is that yeah I mean I suppose it was one of I, I didn't have any brothers or well, not till when I was about nineteen so we've not really had that you know, brotherly relationship, if you like. Um, the situation with my fathers, I had a, a father that basically had, uh, had, had sort of gone separate from my mother when I was about two. 
And then I had a, a stepfather and he was okay. And I'll, I'll give credit where it's due, he did his bit, but it just wasn't quite the same, if you like. Um, so I did tend to radiate towards older people. Um, and clearly I was quite envious of anyone who, you know, any mate who had a good relationship with their dad, you know, the, the fact they even had a dad. Um, and I suppose, so, you know, when I work with older people, I'm not so sure that I was consciously looking at them as a father figure, but I was quite heavily influenced, if you like, because you had a sense of security um, and you matured so much quicker because you had to, you know, in, in their company. So, yeah, so I suppose being in part of a gang culture wasn't too hard to adapt to. It wasn't planned. It was, it just, in fact, it happened quite accidentally because I was far from a fighter. I was far from a, or even a troublemaker. What most kids would get to in the local community, yes. Yeah, pretty innocuous stuff. Um, but an incident at, at a football match when I was 14, uh, up in Manchester, so I remember playing away to Manchester, and I got on my own, which was a st strange thing to do in the early 70s because, you know, anywhere up north was pretty tough. Pretty, you know, you went to Manchester, Liverpool, and Newcastle, places like that. It, you know, it wasn't for the faint hearted. I was so innocent, I didn't know that. So I got there. Um, and I got chased back to the station, was looked after by some older, some older fellas. And then, of course, went into school on the Monday and everyone said, couldn't believe I'd gone to Manchester on my own. Uh, of course, the following week we were at home and I was with some school friends and we were walking up top of my road, walking past the pub. And of course, there were these sort of like 19, 20 year old skinheads. And uh, one of them shouted, oh, Frank, all right, mate, you know, sort of thing. And of course, my friend said, you know, who are they? Well, then that's what I'd give it all the big one, didn't I? I went, that's my mate. So I was up in Manchester with him. You know, not I was a scared 14 year old. I'm suddenly, uh, you know, I'm suddenly one of the boys. So that that kind of grew, if you like, so to the degree where I did become more familiar with people and in their company. Um, and I enjoyed the camaraderie and you, you kind of find out what you're all about as well, because especially, you know, especially if you're up north or, you know, you're somewhere in the Midlands and you're well outnumbered and, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, bigger men and older men than me have it on their toes. Uh, and that's what a lot of it was about, you know, was you going to stand or was you going to run? And uh, I probably had more bottled than sense, but I stood. And um, people recognise that, don't they? So when they see you the next week, they, they kind of acknowledge that and uh, they're happy to have you in their company. And, uh, and if, and again, you know, what the, one of the things that used to be was clearly trying to get into the other team's ends, you know. So if someone said, right, we're going through this turnstile, you took a big gamble going through that turnstile because if other people didn't follow you through, you was in trouble. But again, if you did go through, that was remembered. You know, people would comment on that the following week at the home game, you know, back in the pub. So it, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't something I put any planning into. It just evolved. And you clearly enjoy it. You clearly enjoy that attention. You clearly enjoy that respect. Uh, and, and, and that grew quite a lot. So, uh, yeah, that's how, the, that's how the football kind of thing happened, you know. God, I went all over the, all over Europe with football, you know, pre, even pre-season friendly. Was it, were you, was it always for the tear-up? Or did you enjoy the game as well? No, I did genuinely like football, in all fairness. I played football from a young age, you know, in the street before we had proper football pitches. No, I did have a love for football, you know, and I still do. But it, it certainly filled a void for me, I think, you say, not having brothers, you know, cousins. Um, it, it just, it was a safe, it was a safe house for me because there was that camaraderie. There was that, and I think trust, you know, uh, even loyalty. You have to have a certain amount of loyalty to, to follow people to do what they say they're going to do. Um, and I enjoyed it when it came back to me as well, obviously. So in a way, the football did, did pretty much shape me, I suppose. Um, I did make a comment before where I can imagine where 
some, uh, you know, a group of sociologists or, you know, would say, oh, well, it's quite obvious to me, you know, Frank was violent at the football and he couldn't get enough for that. So he became a street activist and got more violent there. And then when that wasn't enough, he decided to draw on a poem. So I, get, I can see how somebody could write a thesis on that, you know, but it's total nonsense to be quite honest. Um, so, uh, no, but yeah, I say the football would probably be the stuff. And again, what, what do you learn when you're at football in that situation, in that kind of gang situation? Um, you learn how to organise people, don't you? You, you? you start to learn about people. You, there's things you pick up from people. And uh, later on in life, I, yeah, I use those skills that I've picked up. Yeah. I'd love to have been a footballer again, I'll tell you. I, I was lucky, I was in the Marines, so I was getting... Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was getting my my fill of being a man mm. there, right? But you look at young young people at that time in Britain. I don't people have young yeah. people, have, young men have sort of mellowed a bit now, and I don't necessarily know whether that's a good thing or not. In fact, let, let's just say that's another subject. But back then. Your big hard young guy who wants to get out and make something of his life, mm. and you're working in a factory, bloody loading boxes all week, or you're behind a desk. It was your life. It was. It was very much that, and, and don't forget, it was very much the culture of the day. That the music played a big part as well. Um, but certainly, when I was going, it was just football. Everything was football. Seven days a week, you talked about football. You no, no sooner one game was over, you was planning for the next one, you know. So, yeah, it, it was very much the culture of the day. And, and I think you're right. I, I think there was still a, I think there was still a raw toughness. Uh, and, well, you know, you look at it today, we don't, we don't have dockers, do we? We, we, don't, have, we don't have people that work in, uh, in the mines. No. We don't have, you know, steel workers, you know. They, they, big, hard, tough men, you know, hard drinking men. I mean, there's probably quite a few women who are glad they're not around anymore because let's face it, they weren't always the gentlemen when they got home, you know. Um, so I, I appreciate that could cause social problems as well. But yeah, I, I do feel that's kind of, that's passed, uh, passed us by if you like. Um, and I don't think there's the role models either because you did look up to those people. You did get some kind of guidance from those people, sometimes for good, sometimes you know, for bad. But you ask, there's certain things from that culture that, that, have, uh, that have stayed with me. And yes, I did. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it because I enjoyed the camaraderie. I, I, and I enjoyed testing myself, you know, because to go up to Newcastle on a Wednesday night and come home in one piece, the stuff you know, was a bit of a challenge. Um, but you got respected if you did. Um, but I will qualify this by also saying that I reflect on it now, and if, if one person said to me, it's because of people like you, I stopped going to football because my dad said I can't go anymore. That wouldn't make me feel particularly good. And there was an incident in, um, in Dublin years ago when England played, and there was the riot, and if you remember that at all. And it was very, very violent, and there was a picture of a, of a young boy on the pitch with his dad crying his eyes out. Yeah. And you kind of think, well, hold on, there's not much, there's not much glory in that, is there? You know, so that, that kind of makes me balance it out a little bit now and say, well, I think if it's just you, a group of people, and another group of people, when you're in a back street and you decide to punch the living daylights out of each other, that's between you. Yeah. That's, uh, when it impinges on innocent people, it's not quite so glamorous, if you like. That's the bit where it's an outlet for young men who just need an outlet. I mean, you can't yeah. just yeah. work beyond a desk all week and 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 no. do you know drink a pint at the weekend. It don't work like that. But where it become problematic, Frank, was the the disasters, wasn't it? You know, the stadium. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Heisel, whatever was it? The wall was Heisel the wall. That fell down. Yeah, yeah, and then covers obviously you had Hillsborough as and, well, and then Hillsborough was unfairly blamed on people, mm. um, unfairly blamed on 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 football hooligans, wasn't it? Pushing from the back or, or sorry. I've actually been in that same end years before, 
when uh, Tottenham had played Wolves in the semi-final of, uh, of the FA Cup. And if you look at the old footage, you'll see how many people on that occasion had to get onto the pitch and sit around the pitch. So it wasn't as if uh, you know, it hadn't been flagged up in the past. Uh, there was clearly a problem that day. So it didn't come as a surprise to me when that happened. I just probably wouldn't have expected such, you know, disastrous yeah. some deaths, if you like. You know. And the other thing was the weapons, wasn't it? Even down here, people started, they used to stick two razor blades on the end of a ruler. Mm. The idea being it when it cut you, the, the hospital couldn't, because it was a double cut, the hospital couldn't sew it up, right? Mm. And that's just, that just takes it down a messy route again, doesn't it, you know? That wasn't particularly, I, I couldn't really subscribe to that, to be I wasn't really into the weapons thing. I mean, I, I, I think I only ever picked a weapon up once. And uh, that was a game and we'd, we'd, we'd come unstuck. We just were too big for our boots. We were at an away game. There was a few of us. We didn't have much respect for the other, you know, the other mob, so to speak and uh, suddenly became outnumbered and uh, purely by chance there was a house being renovated and there was a skip and a pile of sand and in the pile of sand was a shovel so i picked the shovel up now you know that was more for defensive reasons it was i didn't have any idea i was going to be out of a football match that day and using a shovel you know and fortunately i didn't have to actually you know physically hit anybody with it because the police came around the corner and ounce, you know and it, and it, it, disper it dispersed us. But no, it's not, um, I, I can remember times, that, you know, being at football and, um, and someone, would, you know, would, would, would pull a knife out and I'd kind of think, well, hold on, mate, what's all, what's all that about? How, how badly do you need to hurt somebody? Why can't you just punch somebody? Yeah. You know, it's not something I really approve of, to be honest. How was it then, Frank? Because I watched all the football fight movies I'm trying to avoid the word hooligan because that was a real media word, wasn't it? But <laughs> I've watched all the films and it just seems to be young lads that just want to get stuck in and have a go. They don't, they don't seem particularly skilled in the art of fighting. Was No, no, not so, no. And um, I, I knew plenty of fellas who probably, you know, a straight one for one would have would probably beaten me. You know, I'll, I'll make no bones about that. But whether they had as much bottle as me was, a, was, a, was another story. Um, so, yeah, you could, you know, you could, get, you could attack another crowd of fellas or they could attack you. But clearly why you're punching one fellow and he's punching you, someone's punching you from the side, someone's punching you, someone's, someone's kicking you. And in the days when it was literally hundreds onto hundreds, you, you know, you, you didn't know where the next punch was going to come to. But that's what it was about. It was whether you stood there and accepted if you were going to get a clump, well, you know, the other geezer was going to get a clump, and that was it. That's, to me, that was fair. That was fair. And as I say, the introduction of weapons wasn't really, you know, wasn't my cup of tea, to be honest. Um, when you see the Bruce Lee movies and he's got, he's taken on 30, 30 ninja assassins, <laughs> right? I know ninjas are from Japan before anyone tries to correct me. But when you see that fight scene, you think that wouldn't happen. One guy would just grab him around the head and, every, and everyone would just jump on. I think I've only ever seen one I think I've only ever seen part of one Rambo film. And I remember him standing in the village. He's completely surrounded by people with machine guns. Or maybe they're just ordinary guns, or maybe not machine guns. And they all fire at him. And not one of these bullets hit him. So I say to myself, well, where have them bullets gone then? So if you're in a circle and you're shooting inwards and you're missing him, surely you're shooting each other. But not one bullet hit him. So <laughs> I take your point. <laughs> yeah. So you young lads, Saturday's come around. It's, yeah. ma it's match day. You're either at home or away. You're jumping on the train. Is everyone grabbing like tinnies from, from the offy and... Well, yeah, normally, yeah, normally. I mean, there's times I've travelled by car because obviously the police were getting wise to what people were doing. We, we got to a stage where we'd organise our own coaches uh, so you could come into a town or a city for a different route, not necessarily the one the police had planned for. Um, 
yeah, so there was, a, you know, there was a certain, I mean, not so much in the 70s, I would say. It was, it was a little bit more ad hoc in the, you know, in, in the 70s. But certainly when you started getting into the 80s and the 90s, yeah, it became more, it did become more organised. And uh, I think that's when people kind of got more uh, recognised people that did have those kind of leadership skills, if you like. And basically, what it boils down, if certain people were going, more people would go because they had more confidence because they knew that if those people went, they weren't going to run. They, you know, they, I could say it goes back to the, to the standing bit again, you know, and, uh, but yeah, you know, look, some football fans have different experiences, don't they? I mean, in hindsight now, you know, yeah, it probably would have been nice to go to another club's, you know, social club, you know, stand and have a drink with them, have a chat. That wasn't the culture at the time. It wasn't that at all. Um, looking back, I'm going to say that maybe that would have been a nice thing to do, but, but it wasn't at the time, if you know. What was your club, mate? Tottenham. I was a Tottenham fan. Tottenham. And remind us what what's what's their gang called? Well, funny enough, you, you used to be known back in the seventies by whatever part of the ground that you that you stood in. So. You know, our, our popular end of the ground was the Park Lane. Uh, so we were there for, we were the Park Lane in, you know. Yeah. And, then, um, and when it became less gangs or mobs, as we would call it, it suddenly adopted the title firms. And then the names got more elaborate. So, you know, you, you'd have, you know, Chelsea headhunters and you know, Millwood of Bushwhackers and, West Ham, ICF, you know, the Gooners had more than a, you know, a couple of names they had, um, the Herd, and so on. And, in, and then for some mad reason, Tottenham started calling themselves the Yids. And uh, that goes back to all the years where uh, we were taunted because of the Jewish support that we did have, which was ironic because Arsenal had exactly the same amount. Like West Ham have got more than enough Jewish fans. Uh, but that was, the, that was the term they used to use against us. So it kind of got turned on its head, and people started saying, "Well, that's what they're going to call us. That's what we'll, what they'll, you know, we'll call ourselves." It's not personally. I think it lacks imagination. I think we could have thought of something a little bit more than, you know, a little bit more scary or a little bit more intimidating than that. But that's the one that's that's the one that's that, that, that's stuck. Yeah, and what and. When the drugs came in, that must have added a load more excitement to it as well. Because well, everyone, like, everyone likes their knees up. Yeah, I mean, the casual scene is that my, my generation, so if I started going in the late 60s, and then I grew up and I, I sort of went through the 70s. So our uniform, if you like, uh, the, the group of fellas I was with, we wore donkey jackets, you know, council donkey jackets inexpensive you know cost you nothing if you did the right people so if you if you're having a tear up you're rolling around on the floor you're not going to be worrying about a donkey jack you go and get another one next week or if someone cut it or, or whatever well of course in the 80s and the 90s when the casual scene came in people were very conscious weren't they, of how they looked um, and to some people the look was more important than anything else and then the music came in well i was really too old for that I, was, I, I think I was a little bit too old for that. Um, I was more Chaz and Dave, if you like. Uh, I certainly wasn't into uh, raves and, you know, whereas things and, and so on like that. And, and I don't touch drugs. I don't touch drugs. So it's not really for me. It's not really for me. Um, but, I, but I did like a drink. Yeah, I did like a drink, you know. So as, as much as I tried to stay as clear-headed as I could, I did like the drink. There's no, there's no mm -hmm. doubt about that. But um, no, it's not really, it's not, but that, that culture kind of passed me by. And there, and there was a time when I was, I was out of the way as well because I'd gone to prison. So again, I wasn't really caught up in it. So when I came out and people were talking about certain things, I was a little bit, well, I was all out of that, you know, because I hadn't experienced it. But because I don't do the drugs, I probably wouldn't have experienced it anyway, you know. Yeah. Tottenham got a new ground now, haven't they? Yeah, it's quite impressive. I've been over there a few times now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very impressive. But their old ground was, that was pretty spectacular as well, wasn't it? 
Well, one side of it, what they used to call the shelf, you know, that that, that was quite a, you know, that was quite a nice bit of architecture. To be quite honest, with you. you know, you've got a, you've got a good atmosphere from it. It's just it was the capacity was only thirty six thousand. Well, originally, I mean, you could get, I mean, I think something like seventy thousand years ago before all the seats went in, you know, and yeah. then the capacity was only thirty six thousand, whereas now it's something like sixty two. Um, but yeah, that, yeah, special nights, you know, they played European games. There always was a special atmosphere. There's no doubt about that. Even if there weren't any away fans, it was just those, the thought of playing somebody else, you know, from another country. Um, very vocal, people were very vocal. They used to really enjoy it. Um, but this, this state and that is a different, it's completely a different world. You know, the facilities that they've got at the stadium. Um, you can see they've modelled it very much on America. But the, you can see it's very much, don't be in the local pubs or kebab houses, you know, come into the stadium two or three hours before the game or a couple of hours before the game. Come and eat here. Come and drink here. You know, come and buy your merchandise here. Not off the poor bloke down the road who's trying to earn a living, you know, setting scarves. Um yeah, it's very much based on that, like America, where they, they want you to come into the stadium. And plus, they stay open afterwards as well for a while. And then have bands playing and um, they'll keep the bar open. So, uh, yeah, it's a big money-making machine, that's for sure. I feel fortunate. I went, I think I've been to White Hart Lane once, maybe twice. Um, yeah, a bit of history there. <laughs> mm. Mm. Reminds me of was it Ozzy Ardiles? Yeah, yeah. I actually, I actually went to his first game for Tottenham. Wow, we're showing our age now, Frank. I know, and people always say, people always say, yeah, I remember it. Nottingham Forest away, it was one of. And I said that was not his first game. Him and Ricky Villa's first game was actually in Belgium, and they played Royal Antwerp. Ah. Uh... Uh, I was in a pub where I live and a mate said, it was a Sunday night, and he said, Frankie, what are you doing tomorrow? So we're probably the same as what I'm doing tonight, standing over the drink with you, Bill. And he said, come on, let's go over to, let's go over to Belgium. I said, Bill, I've never been out of England, or probably the UK. Never, certainly never had a passport, never been on a boat. And uh, we went down the post office and got a, a yearly passport. I don't you remember that. <laughs> used to get a bit of cardboard. If you put your photo on it and it was a yearly passport. And before mm. I knew it, I was on a disco boat over to, to uh, Antwerp and uh, Tottenham won 3 1. And I thought we were coming home. And uh, one of the boys said, No, 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 they're playing in Holland tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. They're playing in Venlo, which an army people know well because it's there's an army base in Venlo on the Dutch German border. So it was somebody that had never been out of the country. I'd suddenly been to Belgium and now I landed up in Holland as well. So uh, but that was that was technically the, their first game. Yeah. yeah, lucky you didn't end up in Amsterdam. That would have uh... <laughs> Oh I've got some no, I've had more than enough tear ups in Amsterdam, thank you very much. And <laughs> and as for Venlo, I don't know who's in charge of the army in Venlo, but whoever was, uh, his idea of giving all the army boys the day off so that they could go to the match was not a good idea because, you know, when a couple of hundred cockneys turn up in a town, they're not expecting to see blokes sitting out the bar, outside bars, in Newcastle shirts, Liverpool shirts, Manchester United shirts. <laughs> so we spent more time fighting with the British Army than what we did with the, you know, with the Venlo fans, if you like. And it wasn't intentional, you know. But it was the fact that, you know, well, they're United, they're new, you know, we just let out having a tear up with them. Yeah, and that's the thing that goes with being in the forces. Generally, wherever you go, the local heroes don't don't like you. <laughs> and quite often, because of your behaviour, they're, they're quite right not to like you, you know. Um, yeah, we've certainly been a few. In Amsterdam, we was in a... We was in Amsterdam. I think it was a, it was for a cup match, or it might have even been a, one of the pre-season tournaments we played. And um, you've got two distinct areas there, and one is very much run by the South Moluccans, 
And then there's another there's another group called the uh, Surimanese. So they've, they've sort of got their own distinct areas and obviously where the, you know, the red light districts and obviously where you, know, you go and get your drugs and so on. And um, the local Dutch fellas tend not to mix with them. You know, they tend to stay away. Well, cops, we didn't care, did we? When we got there, you know, we drank as much as we could and, you know, had a good old time. And um, when it came to the evening, well, it just, it, it kicked off big time. And um, the irony is that for the first time I've seen this is that the police were on our side. And that, that does happen very often. <laughs> the local police basically were saying to us, you know, no one's ever come here before and taken the liberty like you've just taken with them, you know. Mm. But uh, I know friends of mine will remember, like, you know, someone getting, you know, someone had an axe, someone had a shotgun. It was pretty, uh, you know, pretty airy stuff. People were getting thrown in the canals, and yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a mad time. But it's the only time I remember a police officers actually congratulating us, you know. But there you go. Mm. And I remember, um, so Ricky, Ricky, I can't remember, v v isn't it? Ricky Villa, yeah, Ricky Villa. And Aussie RD is when the Falklands kicked off. Yeah, that was awkward. Yeah. Everyone was calling for their blood, weren't they? Yeah, that was that was very awkward. That I mean, I know they, they went off the scene, didn't they? They got out of the way there. Uh, which I suppose under the, you know, the circumstances. E e even then, I can remember thinking this shouldn't affect sport. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not their fault, is it? They're... Well, not when you're thrown into something like that. I mean, as long as they didn't make, I think as long as they didn't make any unnecessary comments, you know, which um, to my mind they didn't. Uh, one was to my memory, I don't remember ever saying anything. You know, in fact, I think they dealt with it quite well, to be honest. I think that's why the respect for them continued. You know? Yeah. So, you mentioned being in the neck. Was, was did that interrupt your football uh, violence career? I think I, I think what tended to happen was was when I became more committed to the loyalist cause, if you like. Um, although in the early days I used, I did use football as a vehicle, there's no doubt about that. You know, I did collect money for lawless prisoners. I did sell magazines, badges, etc. Um, oh, in that sense, you know, I was um, I was organising people, I was recruiting people, if you like, mm. very low key in a low key way. If you know, but how did you get sold on the on the cause then? If if you, if you're English. It was it was one of funny enough. Someone said to me the other day, and I said, "Well, Countess Markovitz, who you know, uh, she wasn't a very Irish, and uh, she's a, you know, she's a hero to the Irish Republican movement." And uh, but uh, that was going back to the days of the uh, you know the uprising in, in Dublin. You know, um, but it was a it's a strange path because in my early teens, I was a young socialist for a while. And I, but I didn't know that particularly young socialists were actually part of the Workers' Revolutionary Party. Uh, and they were very, they were very, very middle class. And I didn't, I couldn't, I wasn't really comfortable with them, to be honest. But for people that were so concerned about the working class, I couldn't really identify with them. It wasn't my version of being working class, if you like. Mm. You know, they were more sort of like Hampstead, Belsize Park. Uh, I'm, I'm Kentish Town, Camden Town, Summers Town, you know, very, very working class. So I couldn't really ident identify with that. Some of their terminology go straight over my head, to be honest. Um, and, and clearly they had, a, they had an international view of the world. So they were concerned about the students and the workers and so on uh, in, a, in a, a national context. Well, I was more worried about the bloke down the road. Mm. You know, our own, our own workers, if you like, our own workers' conditions and, 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 and clearly are unemployed. So there was a bit of a clash. I just wasn't aware of it, so certainly not at the beginning. And uh, I, I think what did it for me was, I'll, I've rephrased it now, I wouldn't say they were necessarily pro-IRA or necessarily supporting the actions of the IRA, but they were certainly supporting the, the concept of United Ireland. Um, and I didn't really understand that. Most of the fellows I grew up with were Irish, you know, living in Camden, a very big, very big Irish community. So I, so I was 
quite naive. I didn't really understand that. But eventually I left that, that side of the, the politics. And then my mates made it perfectly clear, Frank, it's the politics of the football, you know, which is it. So I went back to the football. Um, and anyhow, is one night I was talking to somebody, and of course he was right wing. <laughs> I didn't really know the difference between them, you know, right and left anyway. Um, but he he invited me. Bottom line is he invited me to a national front meeting, and uh, and there were clearly more working class people there, and I, and I, I could identify with him. Mm. And um, this is where that this is where the bit I want you know I'll get onto about the addictive nature. Uh, I could have predicted then I'd have landed up running my local branch. The same kind of leadership skills you'd adopted at the football soon started to kick in. This is National Front now, yeah? Yeah, it, started, it, it very much kicked in. And what it was was because they clearly opened up a, a very patriotic side of me that I didn't really know that I'd had, you know? Um, so that was it. I was very much a, I was very much a British nationalist. So the Northern Ireland situation, uh, to me, had nothing to do with religion. It was just one of one part of that community wanted to remain British, um, and and equally, I recognised that the larger part of that island wanted to be independent and distinctly Irish. And run their affairs. So for me, it was quite simple. I thought, well, you know, I can respect your side of it. Why can't you respect this side of it? Why has it got, to, you know, why has it got to be violence and so on? And then it's by association. You meet people, you meet people from there, and then it becomes more personal because friends of people that you know or relations of people that you know are either killed or they've become imprisoned. Uh, or they live in a, they live in an interface area that's attacked on a regular basis, and I think we've all got a site which where we care about people, and when given the opportunity to help people, that you know that most people would, and um, I felt I could you know I could help people, and because there was this kind of I, I've only recognised this in recent years. This isn't something I was aware of at the time. This is where I sit you looking at the podcast and studying myself and, and writing the book. You know, when you start putting yourself into words and then you read back over, you think, is that me? And why did I do that? Or, or whatever. And so I wasn't aware of it at the time, but it's clearly been a pattern, you know. And once I get involved with something, that's it. It's, it's, it's that treadmill story I was telling you. Once I'm on that treadmill, I see nothing else. It's, that, that's the task. And of course, once people give you respect, once people give you responsibility, you, 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 you feel you've got to fulfill that. You don't want to let people down. And what, what I've also recognized is you lose yourself. You forget all about you. You don't see you, you don't identify you. You identify the position that people have put you in. Um, and you know, if you don't fulfill that position, you're letting all those people down. But somewhere along the way, over the years, you've kind of lost you. You're not really sure what you're all about. And um, I said it, I said it some a little while ago, that any creativity that you may have had over that period of time, you've not used. You've not, you've not, you've not used it to your benefit because you've been so focused. Yeah. On, 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 some, on something else. Look, don't get me wrong. Um, some of the comments that have been made to me over the year, you know, you, know, you can call them accolades if you like, the respect that's been shown, the trust and so on. Um, I wouldn't necessarily change that. And I would say that there's certainly been a certain amount of kudos involved. Um, and that's easy to get carried away with if you're not responsible. You also have to take into account that at different times you've um, you've been in a position where it's it's life and death. You know, you you could have had somebody shot. You know, you could you could have had somebody kneecap. Well, I'd like to think I've acted responsibly and I've not used that. You know, I've not um, used that position to kind of exert my power 
but just discipline within the group, if you like. Um, but yeah, you definitely, you definitely lose sight of yourself. And but say between the writing the book and the podcast and having conversations with people, you you, you get a better understanding of yourself. Mm. So you could quite possibly go back to Sean's podcast that I did. It wouldn't necessarily be the same podcast now because I've had all that time to study me and observe myself, question myself and say, well, now that you've identified all of this, what are you going to do about it? You know? mm. But I was very dedicated, Chris. I'm not making any excuses. That, that, that's something I'm very, very, very clear about. Uh, Just hearing, um, it, it sounds like I'm listening to myself, Frank, if I was honest. Um, I'm just going to throw a few things out here just for people at home to, to they can get, they can try and make sense of this. But, you know, we're young, we operate out of our ego. Mm. We come from a background where there's been insecurity in your family, which clearly you, you've experienced and I have. Mm. You're looking for this hope, this um, mysterious home that's going to come and take care of you, give you a sense of worth, give you this importance that maybe that we you know, we didn't have growing up. When you find that family, you are going to fight, fight for them. You're going to be loyal, loyal to them. Right? It's not an interpretation, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I've always been fiercely loyal and I still am. Right. Um, you'd have to do pretty bad things to like lose me as a mate. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Cause I, I think anyway, and the tunnel, the, the, you call it being on the treadmill. I think when you've got this imbalance in your history, or certainly I'm obviously talking about myself now, you, you get your sights on something that makes sense to you. And because of this big black hole in your life, you, you somehow can justify everything that you're doing, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I believed in what I was doing. So there's can no... Give, can I give an example, Frank? So just, again, no. for, for our friends at home so they, so they, they know what, where I'm going with this, it's, it's just like when I was involved in crime, I could justify it, Frank, because to me, I've had hard life. Well, fuck everyone else, you know? Where, where, where were you when this happened to me? Where were you? And, and you use that kind of very... Um, selfish, misguided, naive logic. Mm. Um, does that ring a bell with your story? <laughs> I just, I, I think some of it, yes, yeah, some of it does. I can clearly identify, with, but also there was that, there was that caring side as well. So, so for example, if you're convincing yourself that you're fighting a noble cause on behalf of other people. You've given yourself the excuse to do whatever you want, you see. So that's where I say I'd like to think that I did that in a fairly responsible manner. But when, look, I'm quite fortunate, conscience-wise. As far as, I mean, as far as I'm aware, I haven't taken anybody's life. I'm not sure now if I had what state of mind I'd be in, right? If you, if you take me back a certain amount of years and ask me, was I prepared to, then 100% yes. There's, 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 I'm not going to make excuses. I clearly would have done. And I've also made it perfectly clear to people that if I'd have lived in Belfast, I've got absolutely no doubt I'd either been dead or doing a life sentence. That, 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 that's as clear as day to me now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you're when on your first open visit, so you're still category A, you're still on remand. But the first time you're not behind a screen, you can actually sit opposite your wife and you say to your wife, I'm glad I got caught. And she's shocked, isn't she? You know, she said, what do you mean you're glad you got caught? And, uh, and I said, where on earth did you think this was going? Yeah. You, can't, you couldn't be in my position. You, you couldn't have guns wrapped around you and this not in badly, you know? So... You know, from that point on, I didn't necessarily, 
I didn't necessarily change, but it gave me a, a wake up call. It gave me a wake up call. Saying that throughout the whole of the sentence, I was still of the same mindset. In fact, if anything, to get me through the sentence, I was probably even worse. I was probably more militant in my head to get me through that because I haven't reminded myself, well, what got you here? You know, your loyalty got you here, you know? Um, so that kind of got me through it. But of course, when I got out, when I got out, I was still in the same mindset. Where so did you do your time? Rehabilitation had gone, <laughs> and certainly hadn't worked. Mm. But because it was not, in an offence, there was no attempt at rehabilitation. No one ever spoke to me about the offence. Um, and when I came out, I think there might have been people that thought, oh, that's it, he's done his bit. He's, and it, 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 that wasn't the case at all. And I, and I wasn't a great supporter of the, of the peace process. I, I didn't trust the IRA. I didn't trust Sinn Féin. Uh, I didn't trust our own politicians. Um, and equally, when I went to Northern Ireland, I could see lots of areas that were still being terrorised, you know, interface communities and so on. Mm. So I was in no mood for peace. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. In fact, within a couple of months of coming out and going over to Northern Ireland, I was, I was at a social event. And on the night I was there, the bomb went off in, in Docklands. I think it was the 9th of, 9th of February, 1996. And a chap turned to me and said, oh, Frank, this isn't good for the peace process. And I said, fuck the peace process. A bomb's just gone up in my city. Mm. So I clearly still had that militant, had that militant head about me, you know. How did you, what, what did you end up in the nick for the first time round? I've only been in prison once. No, I've never been in prison once. I mean, sorry, I, sorry. I, I meant the first time you were, you were having dealings in Belfast and you ended up in prison. What, what was it for? It was, I got caught in Birmingham with a bag of guns. I had, um, I had seven um, guns in a bag. And uh, afterwards, they retrieved the rifle as well. Um, so the charge was possession of uh, possession of weapons and uh, supply. I think he was supplying persons unknown with intent to endanger the lives of, of persons unknown. Mm. Yeah, that was the, that was the charges. So, at what point were you starting to get a bit radicalised with, mm. with the with the with the 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 loyalist cause? Yeah. Did did you start to step over the mark and or you know, do you know what I mean? Start breaking the law and putting your liberty at risk. What, what did was I think what started what 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 started to happen was there would be there would be incidents in London where there'd been a bomb or it might have been someone might have been you know, attempted assassination or whatever it be. A few weeks later there would be a Republican march in London. So, for example, in January, you'd have the Troops Out movement. In August, so that would, yeah, that would be the Troops Out movement. In August, you would have the Irish Freedom Movement, would have their anti-internment march up in Holloway Road. Mm -hmm. So what started off as opposition to those parades, so that, and by that I mean physically trying to attack those parades. I kind of got the realisation, well, hold on, hold on. It's not exactly equal, is it? We're throwing a few punches. They're blowing us up. So over a course of time, it was, well, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to go about it? You know, we had no roots there. We had no connections with, uh, with any paramilitary organisation. Um, but we made contact with somebody that was a conduit to people in, in Belfast. And... Eventually, we, we made a meet with the, the appropriate person in London who represented, you know, the Ulster Defence Association. And without making it too long to draw that story, we were, we were thoroughly unimpressive in, basically. Mm. And um, over a course of time, my own group of associates, friends, said, you know, you should be in charge. And we went around the country, we met other people. And I'm, unfortunately, I was even less impressed with some of those. Um, I didn't really identify them as well, I, my perception of the paramilitary organisation. So not meaning to sand it in a mocking way, it was, I'd, I'd kind of say, well, um, you know, so what, why have you not done anything up to now? If you've been around for so many years, why have I never heard you've ever done anything? You know? 
but you can't go and tread on people's toes straight away, can you? You've got to kind of ingratiate yourself. And, and that's what happened over a course of time. We made it perfectly clear that if we were going to be part of that organisation, that we were going to, we were going to acquire weapons. Um, so and we weren't in the hands of other people who we intended to use them as well, you know. So where did you get the weapons from? Well, living in London, it's not hard, is it? To be perfectly honest, you, you, you know, I've grown up and known enough people. I've known enough villains over the years. Mm. Um, you know, I've even, I've even had yardies offer me weapons before now. You know, it, it's not that, it's not that difficult. Um, and where, where, where would they? Excuse my naivety, but I can imagine, you know, getting the odd shotgun or pistol that's been handed down, probably five or six times, but. Yeah. Did you have sort of like AKs coming in from China or, or? No, what happened was I'm glad you I'm glad you said that because this is how we identified that somebody was who was then going to take over from the person we we had no faith in. Mm -hmm. uh, he couldn't wait to take over that position, and we, we we very quickly realized that. And we suspected he wasn't quite what he was making out. He was, you know, he was. And on, an, on one particular evening, uh, a, a friend brought a, a catalog almost. Of, of weapons that we could get via the army. And um, he flipped through the pages and was saying to me, you know, you know, we can have this, we can have that. And this fellow went, yeah, good work, good work, speak to Frank. And another friend said, no, hold on, mate, you're supposed to be in charge. If we take a dive, you take a dive. And we could see he never had the art for it. He wanted the position. He, we could see he, he, he just, he wasn't the, the genuine article as far as we were concerned. So again, that elevated me to the front. So now I've got a responsibility now, haven't I? So in order to do that, I'm encouraging these people to be militant. Now they put me in charge. So I've got to be twice as militant because I'm there, you now I'm, I'm there leading them. And uh, there was an incident where we were actually offered, uh, we were offered hand grenades and we had this huge quarry where we could, where we suggested to this chap that we want at least one. You know, we need, you can't be throw one once, can't you? You know, you can't use it again. And he was a bit standoffish, this fella. He was a bit standoffish. We couldn't understand it because there was a lot of money involved, a lot of money. And uh, one day, one of our chaps was followed. And all of a sudden, this bloke was too helpful. I'll take as many as you like, you know, within reason. And we thought there's something wrong here. And uh, we, we called it off, basically. And uh, a few years later, when I was being questioned by military intelligence, they brought the subject to an grenade. And that goes back to the story where I said I would have gone into somewhere and I'd have, you know, that's our mm. committed, if you want to call it, educated, if you want to call it, I would have gone into certain establishments and I'd have had no qualms about a front of grenade. Of course, as I said it, I hadn't done the explanation bit. It wasn't actually going to be anybody in the club, you know. Um, so, yeah, there was access to some pretty naughty stuff, if I'm honest. And this is where the state plays its part as well. What I did get caught with, although I was quite capable of, uh, of killing somebody, it wasn't the most sophisticated you know the irony is the more sophisticated stuff that we could have got but we wouldn't have necessarily been able to afford to purchase ourselves we would need that from elsewhere that once you declared how militant you were well, of course you had to trust whoever you were telling elsewhere big mistake big big mistake because as as, as we all know now that the Republican movement was absolutely riddled with informers and, and, and so was the loyalist movement. So people you respected and you trusted because you thought, well, for them to be in the position that they're in, their men must trust them, mustn't they? And they've got the power in life of the F over people as well. So they must be important, these people. So I can talk to these people or this individual person. Of course, you find out down the line, they've been working for the RUC or special branch or military intelligence. Or... So you suddenly realise some of the things you were planning on doing, why they never happened. 
because no, no sooner you'd had the conversation with somebody, they'd gone and sold their anger. Yeah. Now, in hindsight, that's, in hindsight, that's kept me out of prison, isn't it? That's kept me out of prison a lot longer. So in some respects, I think, well, that's worked in my, it's worked in my favour. But when you've been planning on doing things for, a, for quite some time, somebody comes over and suddenly says, oh, listen, we've got, we've got a sympathetic officer and he's told us he's been talking to special branch on the mainland. You boys are being observed. They know what you're doing. You know, go and play out politics for six months. When you've got your adrenaline up, when you've been planning to, to do certain things, you know, it's, it's a bit demoralising. So in hindsight, we shouldn't have been so open about what our plans were to be honest, and it was quite extreme. I mean, you know, there, we had certain targets which would have, you wouldn't have got 20 years, you'd have got 40 years probably, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I think what a lot of people don't consider as well, if you look at the troubles, uh, talking, you know, both sides of the water, bombs going off, Let's say, let's just say a thousand bombs went off, a thousand IEDs or whatever. Mm. I think we'd have to be pretty naive to not factor in how many were set off by by British special, you know, British Secret Service for their own political aims or to steer the course of the, you know. Every, everyone seems to think it's quite cut, you know, it was cut and dry, but. I think the thing is, I think the thing is now, I mean, we are, we had an incident one night where we were, um, we set up a group where we were going to communities, various communities, and we started to talk to people and, and actually ask what they wanted, not what we perceived that they wanted. And uh, we had an incident one night where uh, um, we sat around with a group of women in a community centre. And one woman was describing how she lived in like a bungalow and she couldn't distinguish between whether it was a brick hitting her roof or a petrol pump. We suddenly realised she was blind, which must have been even more terrifying. And uh, there were grown men who had tears in their eyes. There's no, there's no, that making excuses to go to the toilet. And I said before, when men show their emotions like that, they don't like it. So they tend to go the other way. They tend to go, fucking know what we're going to do. We've got a little bitch woman, come on, we've got to be, you know, um, but going down, you soon realise going down the road and shooting someone, that's not solving her problem, is it? You know, going to put a bomb somewhere, it's not solving her problem, is it? So, what's the best thing to do? Disempower these people in some way, you know. Um, let's improve their conditions. You know, if you're getting petrol bombs, well, let's make sure they've got fire extinguishers or fire blankets. You know, they wouldn't leave their estate because if they left their estate, they'd get attacked. So, we had a function and raise money for a like a faulty foot um, container, and it was converted into a shop. So my mindset suddenly was: hold on, you can still be that caring, helping person. There's another way of doing it. There's another way of doing it. So we we started to go around various communities. We we raised money for a school bus. The school potentially could have shut down because it. It wasn't getting enough pupils coming from another area. They couldn't afford the minibus, so we raised money for the minute. So, yeah, I became doing more community work. I started, and I, and, I, and, I, and I got a lot of pleasure out of it. I think there was still that little bit of militancy there. Um, but thankfully, over the years, the need for that became less necessary. Mm. And also the fact you, <laughs> you didn't trust people like you did before either. So... You, 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 try to, you, you sort of came back, you know, amongst your own and was quite content amongst your own, if you like. Um, but uh, for somebody that wasn't necessarily for the peace process at the time when, you know, most people were subscribing to it, I, I am a supporter of it now. It's not ideal. I don't think it's perfect. Um, but the fact people aren't going to prison anymore and, uh, you know, you're not able to go to the graveyards and bury people, which... I think the young are sometimes got a bit of a romantic view of it. You know, they look back on it. They might want to be like their brother was or their uncle or their dad or their granddad. You know, I, I get it. I do kind of get it. 
is people now who wish they was around in the days of football hooligans. People wish they were around in the days of mods and rockers. You know, it's all right being nostalgic about it, but this was far more, far more dangerous and far more sinister. You know, mm. um, and and, and it, it, it's not nice. It's, it's just not nice, and and it turns you into someone who you look back and you start, you know, criticizing yourself in some way, analyzing yourself certainly. Mm. You think, would I have done that? Would I have been capable of that? And of course, it's difficult for me to call somebody else, what are they were terrorists? We were freedom fighters, they were terrorists. I'd have done the same as them, probably. Maybe not some of the more, what's up, some of the things they did, I thought was a little bit too grotesque, to be honest. But was I any different? You know, and, and, and as someone very well respected, he's no longer with us, did say, you know. No side is, was exclusively right. None was exclusively wrong. So I, I kind of, that is kind of my mentor. Now, I don't claim to be totally right. And I, and I wasn't totally wrong. Mm. Can we just talk a bit nit, nitty gritty, Frank? Um, yeah, sure. Are we, how, how, many, how much time did you spend in Belfast, were you, were you there years or? Oh, regularly, I was there quite on a quite regular basis. Yeah. We, can I ask, we, without obviously getting yourself or anyone in trouble, what what sort of area was Ty, Ty, Tiger Bay was a Protestant area, wasn't it? Yeah, Tigers Bay. I knew I knew Tigers Bay. The first place I ever went to in the, in the mid eighties was, was uh, Lisbon, which was just sat was just Lisbon, south. Lisbon, yeah. Of, Sh um, Sh Shank Shankill was Protestant. Shankill was West. That, that's that's West Belfast. West Belfast, Shankill Road. That one year I was there was when there was a fun run. The army did a fun run in Lisbon, and there was a bomb under a vehicle. Um, yeah, that was that was that was that wasn't a nice occasion at all. And I, I was over, actually over there that year when it happened. Yeah, that doesn't sound like fun. A fun run, does it? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Most areas over a course of time. Um, what years? What years were you there, mate? Mid eighties was the first time I went. Mid eighties, yeah. first time I went. Had the Had the Gibraltar three been shot by then? No, no, that came after. That was about eighty seven ish, wasn't it? That, that was just after. I was, I was going just before then. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I'm just trying to gauge because I was there in what eighty eighty nine. Mm. A similar time and well i was going from the mid 80s up until 90 well until i was arrested 93 may may 93 and what sort of atrocities did you see during your time there what acts well, i saw the aftermath you know but mainly it was the aftermath the feeling of people uh the loss of some people clearly the anger of, of, of people as well you know um, it's strange because the first time I did go I went with somebody else and many people have said this since after they've been the first time I think you're overwhelmed by the sense of Britishness that they are so proud to be British they're so proud of their, their history their, you know, particularly the Somme and you know, the First World War uh, they are ultra proud to be British. Well, yeah, of course I've met people back in, in London who were proud to be British and uh, myself to a certain degree, but not like this, you know, and I've never seen so many union flags in my life. So it was very welcoming. People were very, very friendly. They loved the, the fact that you'd come from London and to spend time with them. Um, yeah, it was quite easy to fall into, to be honest. Mm. Um, and, I've, and I've, you know, I've had friendships from from that first trip that, that, that are still here today. You know, mm. I've stopped a guy in the Ardoin, right? <laughs> and he's driving a like an old Cortina or Sierra or something. And I said, "Can I?" You, you stop him, and he, and he winds his window down. So, can I have a word, mate? Yeah, sure, mate. And he's fucking from London somewhere, right? And we're chatting, and this guy's like oozing Cockney friendship. You know, just it's all good. It's well, you don't live in the Ardoin as an Englishman. No, 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 no. You're out in Green, which is kind of like part yeah. of 
without having some serious connections. And I think he was married to one of the top players, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, right. okay. sis, sisters or something, right? Yeah. Um, so when we pee checked him afterwards, or when I pee, pee checked him while, while, while he was stopped there, it, it, it comes over, yeah, you know, affirmative. So this is a IRA player. Yeah. And of course, by that, they've, I guess a lot of people are just affiliated, aren't they? They're affiliated. They're not actually soldiers or whatever. Um, we used to get stopped sometimes. We'd be, been a, you know, we'd be in a, a taxi, we'd be in a cab, and the army would stop us. Of course, they'd get a shot because sometimes uh, the soldier would be from London. You know, <laughs> so they're not expected to have the window wound down. And we go, all right, mate. And all of a sudden, so I go, what the fuck are you boys doing over here? Like, I've got to be here. You know, I'm in the army. I'm, you know, I'm doing my service. What the fuck are you doing over here? Like, you know. So yeah, we had some, uh, we had some, some fun experiences. Were you there when the signalers were executed? I wasn't physically there, no. But I remember the day we've, we've discussed quite. Oh a bit. God, that was just Woods, Woods and Howes, wasn't it? Woods and Howes, yeah. 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 yeah, just very uh, bad period. That was that that those 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 few weeks were a uh, were, were, were a very very uncomfortable time for everybody. I think because uh, the gloves were off, weren't they? The, the, the gloves were off. That's well, sure. we we were doing our pre island build up, and when we were doing it, so for people listen before you go on a tour a operational tour you do your training and it's called build up um obviously you do it in all areas of what you're expected to go and fight or, or be involved in mm. so shooting first aid um a little bit about culture but to be honest it wasn't really very <laughs> we weren't really too interested in 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 that and uh you just get these sheets terrorist recognition sheets or we call them players right mm. um did you call them montages they might well have been uh they basically is an a4 sheet and it had about the passport um, passport size photos and it had about 30 on there and you had these sheets and you had to mem memorize them mm. another thing again i had a photographic memory so when we had finally got over the water I could I spotted everyone yeah. just as if as if I'd known them all my life. You know, I'd see someone in a car on the other side of the road, you know, at traffic lights or whatever, and I just but I'm getting off the subject. So we're doing this build up, and one of the boys goes here, look at this, and he had a tabloid newspaper and he opened the, the spread and it was the picture from the helicopter mm. down onto that um Again, for friends listening, was it Corporal Howes and? I think they were both corporals, weren't they? Yeah, Woods, I remember it was Woods and Howes. Well, yeah. Corporal Woods and Corporal Howes. I think it was. Um, I'm not sure whether they were intelligence or whether they were signals intelligence. I think they were signalers, but signals intelligence. But I might yeah. have that wrong. But they accidentally, on a tour of Belfast in an undercover car drove into an IRA funeral mm. very quickly the people in the funeral realized they're British soldiers so they blocked them in with a taxi and these guys couldn't get out one of them pulled his nine millimeter out fired I think one warning shot but then accidentally dropped the magazine which then fell clattered on the floor or fell on the floor of the car anyway slowly they were overcome by the crowd dragged out, stripped off and executed, mm. executed on Wasteland, a place called Penny Lane, which we used to patrol past regularly. And I think even at the very last minute, one of them tried to make a run for it. Um, so they, they, you know, they were fighting until till the end, but it was... A a another theory was in regards to why, why they were attacked, which I can, under which I would be able to understand was that because Michael Stone had attacked the Republican funeral um, at Mealtown, mm. that some Republicans were of the view that when they saw two men in a car, they, they wasn't sure whether that was going to be a repeat of what had happened in 
Milltown Cemetery. And that would make sense. That would make sense. Because I can't see how they could have known who those two fellows were. Yes, you could jump to conclusions and say, oh, they must be, you know, undercover police or undercover army or military intelligence. Personally, I, I would have been more concerned to think that, hold on, are these two loyalist paramilitaries, you know, about to drive into the crowd and, and open up with, you know, heavy weapons or, or you know, grenades or, or whatever. I, I could kind of understand that. But I know, as you're right, the official version is, is that, um, that it was the fact that they were, you know, they were army personnel. How many Republicans were aware of that at the time, I'm not sure. Yeah, it was just, it was just shocking, wasn't it? Beyond shocking. Mm. And, mm. and just one incident of many horrific ones during the Troubles and mm. on both sides of the divide, obviously. On well, that's why I say it had to come to a stop, didn't it? It's just, it's just, it had to come to a stop. You, you, you couldn't carry on with that, you know, with that degree of violence and, and you know, humans doing certain things humans it just had to whatever your views were whoever you thought you were right or you was wrong it, it had to stop and, and that's why i was saying now that you know I, I, i'm looking back on it now i'm very much an advocate for peace yeah and, and and myself too and i think a lot of people like have seen a bit of the world like we are i mean it, it, you could be like a five-year-old boy whose dad's just been at the pub dad's walking back from the pub he's not he's not a soldier he's not a fighter he's not involved yeah. in anything he's just a hard-working man mm. a protestant gang or a catholic gang can bundle him into the car haul him off and torture him all night mm. then slit slit his throat and chuck him out of the car on wasteland and that mm. little boy or girl got to live with that shit for the rest of their life well, I, I, said in, I said in one of the podcasts, look, it, 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 it's too simple for me to sit here and say, well, my conscience is clear. I haven't killed anybody. But if the police came to me tomorrow and said we've, um, with forensic, you know, modern forensic evidence, we've identified the weapons you'd thought, you know, you'd supplied earlier. One of those has killed uh, a Catholic, you know, not a Republican necessarily. Um, and he had five children. And he's, he's, uh, his wife had a nervous breakdown. He's, six weeks later, his mother died of an heart attack. Well, I'm not gonna feel very good about myself, am I? I'm not gonna feel very heroic, am I? I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna feel well, I've done my bit for the cause, am I? And that's it. But it goes back to that treadmill. You do not think that at the time, do you? You do not think that. You're in charge, you're leading your men, and, and, and there's an expectation about you. And if, if, if our people are being attacked, if our towns and cities are being blown up, mm -hmm. we've got to go and do something about it. You haven't got time to stop and question yourself. You just, you just don't. Mm -hmm. um, and look, and that's why now, if I, you know, when I do talks, I make sure I say to people, don't get on that treadmill. Don't get on it. Or if you're gonna do your own work, you know, question yourself, why are you getting on it? What are the reasons for it? Is it, is it your, own, your own vanity? Is it because people are trusting you to get on it? Why are they not getting on it? So this is another question I ask now. Why are, some, why are people so quick to put you on the treadmill? You, know, you don't ask enough questions, do you? You get carried away at the time. You think, oh, you know, I'm the man. They all trust me. They respect me. You don't see the potential damage. Not, not only what you're doing to other people, what you're doing to yourself, and I, and I recognise that now. I can I can see that quite clearly now. And uh, whether I go into schools, colleges, you know, university or prisons, you know, I, I'm quite comfortable and I'm quite happy to say to people, listen, don't go down this road. You know, just do not go. Try and find another way to do it because people say to me, why did you never become political? You know, why didn't you get involved in, in the politics of it? Why did not you know, I just didn't see that at the time. Look, in hindsight now, I wish I had. I wish I had. I wish I'd used my time and effort, uh, you know, more politically rather than militantly, you know. But mm. 
But it's all a learning curve, isn't it? It's all a learning curve, isn't it? I can pass some of that knowledge on to people now. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to do that. Someone said to me recently, oh, Frank, can't you see that to some degree you, you was radicalised? And I, I'm sorry, Chris, I laughed. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. I was the one doing the radicalising. I can see that now. Any of my close friends and associates follow me. Not the calls. I haven't even been loyal to me. So I said, let's go and do this. They go and do it. Mm. I'll be intrigued to know how many were it's actually good. doing what they were doing for, for a supposed cause. And that's a responsibility. And I, and I accept that responsibility. And I'm quite happy to analyse myself and question myself. Mm. And, uh, and, and I can see that. And the only odd thing is I didn't get anybody else killed. <laughs> And I didn't get anybody else imprisoned. Mm. So in that sense, I'm fairly content. But that could have gone wrong. That could have gone. My actions could have got close friends killed or could have got me in prison for a long, long time. Mm. You know? And uh, as I say, I'm, I'm quite happy to talk to people now and say, just, just, just don't do it. And I've, I've, I've just recently um, started a, a website a couple of weeks ago. I've got a website, www.frankportonai.com, and uh, that explains where, you know, 1993, um, I was in Winston Green, you know, I've been arrested in Birmingham, and I was on Category A in Winston Green. Yet in May 2011, I was at uh, a um, state visit in Dublin where the Queen was present. So there's the change, you know, there's the, there's the transition where I'd gone from being militant to doing things in the community. I mean, the Queen herself didn't invite me, obviously. Would be, you know, but clearly there was, um, there was clearance. Some would have recognised what I was doing and there was clearance for me to be able to go. And that was the first time that a royal, a British royal, stepped foot in Dublin for hundreds of years. It was a very, you know, historical occasion and, um, and a very surreal one as well. Very surreal. That was fairly recently, wasn't it? In the last couple of years. 2011. And what it was was to, ah, okay. to remember the 50,000 Irishmen who'd fought alongside Britain during um, the First World War. And of course, had come back and been totally ostracised. Uh, couldn't get work, couldn't you know, find places to live because they fought with the, because they'd fought with the British. And uh, thankfully now, because of cross-border community groups and, and so on, um, eventually... Was that, was that the Second World War they fought for? The first, no, it, was the, it, was, it was the First World War. But, I mean, obviously we fought, us, fought together in the Second World War, but it was mainly the First World War. And like I say, they were just completely ostracised from society. Mm. And fortunately now, I'm saying it was surreal because you had Irish Army, you had British Army, you had the AAA, you had the Union flag, you had both Hamptons, you had the President of Ireland, you had the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, yeah, very historical occasion. So from, from a personal point of view, you know, 1993, it's Her Majesty's pleasure. Uh, in, in 2011, I'm, I'm getting invited, you know, with a nice embossed card with, you know, Her Majesty would like you to be in, in, in Dublin on a certain date. So, uh, yeah, there's been a, a strange journey, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, you've got, you know, you should be proud of you. Proud of you. So, well, I'm sure you are, Frank, you know. It's... Well, there's more to go. There's more to go. You know, there's, 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 more, there's more to give yet. And funny enough, um, a few people have suggested that I, that I do a podcast and I've never had, really had the technical skills or the opportunities. And... Um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, I'd suggested a guest that I thought was a very, very good guest uh, to somebody. Um, I had to get in touch with their secretary, if you like, sent a couple of emails and got no response. And uh, I was a little bit put out, to be quite honest. I'd rather have had, oh, this isn't really somebody that we want, or at least a response of some kind. Um, and then that kind of put it in my head, well, do you know what? If you don't want to interview this person, I'll interview them. Mm. And the chap who's, who designed my website um, has, has got the equipment 
and, uh, and, and has basically made a commitment. And um, I found a sponsor to help me with the first few episodes. So, uh, frankly speaking, we'll be uh, on air sometime next year. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Um, we give it a go, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's another part of the journey, isn't it? <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, because... Hey, there's it, nothing bad about it. Well, the thing is, you see, if people only know your past, they're going to they're judge you now on, on that past. So people still refer to me as that football hooligan. People still re refer to me as that right-wing activist. People still refer to me as that loyalist paramilitary. Um, particularly the media. The media just do not let go and they just regurgitate the same old rubbish. Journalists do the same. People have written books where I've been mentioned in. They've got my name wrong. They've got the sentence wrong. They've said I've had a drugs conviction. They don't come and speak to me. They don't ask. They don't check, you know. And um, that's why I wrote my own book. That's why I wrote my book. I thought, well, you're going to get the truth from me, one way or the other, you know, the good bits and the not so good bits. Um, and I'm just writing another one now to finish off the story, uh, to show some of that, that transition. You know? How's, um, how did Sean get involved in that? Here's my opportunity. Yes, please do. I was, I was just going to read the name out. Yes. I wasn't being rude. It's called, it's called Left Right Loyalist from one extreme to another, which pretty much sums me up because I've gone from one extreme to another. Um, Sean invited me along and um, he clearly, you know, he read the book. And uh, from that, um, Sean said to me, um, had I considered doing another book? And I said, yes. He couldn't believe that I didn't have the book on Amazon. He, he, so he said to me, look, um, would you mind if I rebranded it, so to speak? So if you go on Amazon, you'll see that cover, but you won't see that title. Mm -hmm. uh, it says Loyalist Paramilitary Gunrunner uh, from Extremism to Prison. Uh, so he'd be very helpful, Sean, very helpful. Uh, he invited me back again for a second podcast and then earlier this year uh, in January, I got invited uh, by um, James um, they didn't try and borrow money off you did they <laughs> no no they didn't no. yeah now those two have been responsible for really um supporting a lot of us haven't they you know yeah, yeah credit yeah, to get our stories out and and it's a big old thing when you hit one of those big podcasts yeah uh, your life is it it's it it really helps you on your way so i've got a, a, a debt of gratitude yeah um yeah i think yeah between them yeah they've they've, got, they've given me a, a confidence to talk more publicly saying that i am um, an associate member of the um professional speaking association very early days uh, i've got a very good mentor he's been he's been guiding me along the way um Unfortunately, of course, there's not something there's not been meeting. We've had to do everything via Zoom, but that in itself is an experience as well. Mm. Um, and I'm fairly confident next year, but again, depending on the climate, you know, appreciate companies have obviously got budgets um, and they're probably going to stick to speakers that they know rather than take a gamble on new ones. But saying that, if they want to be new stories, um, and, um, you know, new lessons to learn, if you like. Um, and, and that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm saying to people, like, you know, if you, want, if you want to listen to different experiences, different stories, and, uh, and, uh, and, and learn something from it as well, whether that be, uh, you know, speaking or training sessions or whatever. And I think the podcast will help, I think, to, uh, to sit and talk to people. And again, when I was in prison, I was a listener. So you learn to talk to people, not necessarily advise them, but you learn to listen to people. So I'm quite looking forward to trying the questions out and, and waiting for people's responses, you know. So Frank, people can find your book on Amazon. Yep. I'll, I'm going to put a link below our, our video. Um, 
where else can they find someone wants you to come and speak i'll i'll put that link as as well but what's the company called are you, are you with an agent well, ironically i've just started a company and uh, I, i've called it category a um, consultancy that's to kind of remind me where i come from if you like the mm. category a bit um but certainly it's, it's a reminder where i want to go as well you know where i want to arrive at um but yeah the the the, the website will it will explain what i've done is I've, I've i've written some articles and every every article has kind of got a moral to it and without putting my name to it necessarily it's clearly about my experiences mm. and um, and most definitely the treadmill story is a uh, is on there and that's what i'm saying to people look no um i believe i can come along and give real life stories you know real life experiences um and and hopefully you know people will take something from it and uh, it'll be a benefit to them you know? yeah well undoubtedly undoubtedly it, it will yeah. well frank thank you ever so much for joining us no, thank you. No, thank you. Because no, it's, it's, it's part of my learning curve, to be quite honest. Yeah, yeah, if I can help you with a podcast, just let me know. No, I appreciate that. I'd love, to, I'd love to come and chat to you then. Uh, <laughs> I, you can did. Relax, I can relax a bit then. I, you just talk just, I didn't even ask, did I? You see, you just committed yourself <laughs> there. You see? That's part of my technique. <laughs> Mate, you got to get in, get, get, get in early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Frank, just, just stay on the line. I'll say a proper thank you when we stop recording. Um, so massive thank you again. Thank you. Good luck. Keep, uh, you know, keep going into the light, isn't it, for us guys? Yeah. To everybody at home, massive love to you all. Look after yourselves. If you could like and subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. And see you soon. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.